Welcome, brothers and sisters, to another edition of Ongoing Study on Course 108. You know, this morning as I was before the Lord and He took me to the Word, saw how Saul lost the kingdom. He tried to modify the instructions of Elohim and why David was chosen. And the Lord began to speak to me about how the church since the fourth century has been in business of modifying his purpose, his plan, his church. And in the process of doing that, we have the two broad divisions of Christianity today, the right and the left. The right being those who want us to go into cultural wars over everything, fight with sinners and hate them and box them. And then the left are those who want us to leave the gospel and go into social justice work and uh, climate change and, and be so concerned with all the humanistic things that can be bunched together and become the new norm. And brothers and sisters, Christian religion where well, these two broad divisions of right and left as one mortal actually is healed. We've touched on them over the past few lessons. It is a tendency to strip sins of their real identity. And, in this, and, and, and instead of the king of kings who is the core of our, who we are, when they strip us of this identity, then it goes on to make people to rotate around human leaders and around denominations and church. And stripped of this vital identity, believers are unable to come into the fullness of who they are. Brothers and sisters, they become disciples of humans. They become disciples of churches, not disciples of Yeshua, not citizens and ambassadors of the kingdom. So, growing up in church and doing church stuff and building church, they think that they are building the kingdom. They think they are growing. They have title. They have this. Brothers and sisters, as they are programmed to swallow hook, line, and sinker, whatever comes out of the mouth of their human leaders, they lose their ability to be like the saints of Berea who will search the scriptures to see whether what Paul was saying was right. Brothers and sisters, it's so important that we understand that this is how heresy can take root. So much so that one major church leader said, even if he fasts on the altar, the people will shout hallelujah, praise God. Because there's a new idol on the altar, a human leader. Brothers and sisters, we need to get to understand the Lord is trying to win us away from all those things that define churchianity and teach us the gospel of the kingdom, which is what Yeshua gave us to, to, to preach and to teach and to demonstrate. So let us pray and get into the world today. Father in heaven, the great I am who I am, we surrender ourselves to you, have your way and instruct us through your word by your spirit, grant us understanding in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. So we're going to build on the foundation laid in lesson 10, which considered how Peter and Paul framed the royal priesthood as the first level expression of the kingdom church. So in this lesson, we'll include insights from Apostle Paul concerning the profile of the new breed of humans who are to exist or coexist in the same air stream with other human beings, separate but not isolated. They will not be religious persons whose identity is in the man of God or woman of God or the religious corporation or denomination they are part of. Brothers and sisters, for the true kingdom church to truly manifest, which we spoke about yesterday, that the first level church is the redeemed of the Lord, the individual saints. For that to happen, then it is important that we will drop the old paradigm of religion, which is what we call the theater paradigm, when ministers become super preachers, preaching, hyper preach, high octane, just was all of people's emotion, and at the end of it, the money. And people jump up and jump down, but nothing has happened. Nothing has penetrated their hearts. 
Once they are in the church setting, they are hyperactive. Praise, worship, all kinds of things. Prophecy, all that. Outside the church, they are still bare. So how did Yeshua do his own? How did Paul do it? They didn't do the theater paradigm. It is not that people didn't come to them. People came. Masses came. But Yeshua and Paul adopted the school paradigm. School paradigm connotes that they intentionally taught the people the world. That's what we call today the T tier process. T tier. T. The first one stands for teach. Yeshua taught the people the world systematically. And then he says, Go and teach them all things I taught you. And that's what Paul did. The revelation he received, he taught systematically. Whether it was one person or two or five or ten or a thousand, it didn't matter. He taught them the word. Then the other T is train. And that training has to do with training the teaching. Let me go back a little bit. Teaching turns people to disciples. When you are taught, you become a disciple through the word that penetrates your mind and your heart. Then those who are Disciples need to be trained. They need to be trained to come to the understand the mandate of the kingdom and how to execute the king's command to disciple the nations. It requires training. Then the third one is E, equip. People need to be equipped, given some one-on-one -on -one attention. They can ask questions of the leader. The leader can kind of basically come to coach them, instruct them, challenge them, identify what is in them, and enable them to get it until they get it. Then the fourth one is activate. The gifts and callings of Holy Spirit are in people, latent. It takes the right kind of person to be used by Holy Spirit to activate what is in you that is latent. Then the fifth one is release, which is when you teach Train, equip, activate. There comes a day you release them to serve the Lord. You commission them to serve the Lord. There comes a day for that to happen. Excuse me. Okay. So when that day you commission them, that's what Yeshua did. For three and a half years, the disciples were with him. Then he commissioned them, brought the Holy Spirit in the upper room. For them to go forth. And Paul continued that tradition, confirming the states, commissioning them. And that's what the early church did. Brothers and sisters, the whole idea is to truly ensure that believers get to know certain truths that will liberate them. Because the Bible says in the book of John 8 32, you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. So instead of just preaching whatever comes to heart, instead of just listening to something on television or radio and they go to the pulpit and preach it and there's no beginning, no ending, instead of just pumping up emotion of people, for that primary block of the kingdom church to come to pass, the Lord will require those who are already disciples by His grace to intentionally be invested in that TTA process, and men and brethren, there are three broad things I would like to say to you today that should be part of any process of bringing people to knowledge of who they are. Because the, the one who is going to be a kingdom citizen and ambassador, he has to know his identity relative to other people. In other words, though there are 7.7 .7 or 7.9 billion people on earth right now, as far as the king of kings is concerned, generality are walking on the broad way, away from him, and there's a minority walking on the narrow way. Now, let's look at what Peter said they are. We mentioned it yesterday, but let's break it down. First Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, chosen out of the world. Two, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show for the presence of him who has called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of Elohim, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, 
they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify Elohim in the of this nation. So Peter taught the people that they were unique. Though they were in the world, they are not of the world. And brothers and sisters, so these religious leaders who want us to go and join party A, join party B, to fight this cause and fight that cause. Those religious leaders who want the church to lose its independence and identity and go and embrace uncircumcised Philistines, people who are still in darkness, people who are covenanted to the occult, to go into cahoots with them, that is mystery Babylon. Brothers and sisters, don't let anybody deceive you. It doesn't matter who they are. No matter how much you love them. Once you see a religion, once you see a leader who wants to take you to go and embrace the worldly political system, whole lock, stock, and barrel, you see mystery Babylon be cutting you. Because that's where it will end. A union of church and state can never be for good. It will lead to mystery Babylon. And mystery Babylon is a religion that will prepare the way for the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to come from mystery Babylon. It's going to come as a result of mystery Babylon. Because the Antichrist will always seek to be in cahoots with the church. So brothers and sisters, Peter didn't tell them to go and embrace Rome or embrace the Pharisees and Sadducees. Peter said 10 things in this passage. One, you are a chosen generation. It is Elohim who chooses. And Paul said it's before the foundation of the world. Two, you are a royal priesthood. You are not church folks. You are not religious folks. You are a royal priesthood. In other words, you have to be priests and kings, as we saw yesterday. Three, you are a holy nation. You are no longer sinners, but are now holy unto the Lord. Four, you are peculiar people. In other words, the life of the saints are intrinsically different from the world around them. The world is on the broad way. The saints are on the narrow way, less travel. A peculiar treasure to the Lord. Number five. You should show for the praises of him who called you out of darkness. In other words, gratitude for our redemption is supposed to drive our lives. You see, people tend to be concerned about what they will get, what they will get, what they will get. The Lord wants us to be filled with gratitude, thanksgiving, and praise for how he redeemed us from all the things of the world, the darkness, how he's opened our eyes, how we are, who we are in him. That should drive our life. So number six, we are now the people of Elohim. The God of Israel, we are now his people on earth. Number seven, the mercy of Elohim, which endures forever as Psalm 103 expounds, is now our portion. That mercy is the one that, you know what, ensures that the Lord doesn't deal with us according to what we deserve, but his mercy takes over. Number eight, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we are just having a bodily experience in the earth realm. And so, we are not like other people. We are strangers. We are pilgrims. The world system is selfish, self-centered. The world system is about accumulating stuff. But we are strangers and pilgrims not working like them. We are not involved in their rat race for stuff. Number nine, in this regard, the Lord now expects us to abstain from fleshly lust because such things war against the soul. James talked about it in James chapter 4. Lusting, lusting. You want this, you want that, you want that, you want that, you want that. And that lusting was against his soul because he makes his soul unable to rise to the dimension of where it ought to be. And then number 10, the transparent, superior, worldly lifestyle of saints is designed to be so evident through the good works that comes out that unbelievers can see in their workplaces, they can see the difference, the way you live, your charity, your love, your care. It's so evident that in the day of visitation, that's what the Holy Spirit will use to convict them. In the days they are told to surrender, the Lord will show them, just like Yeshua said, Elijah is a man of like passion, yet he showed that oh, this one is in the office, he doesn't crack this bowdy Lewis jokes we crack, it doesn't engage in all the filthy things we do, yet he's one of us in this place, so they can see the difference. So, 
Peter has spoke about 10 things that the royal priesthood had and it makes them different from the world. Now, brothers and sisters, Paul went further to speak about 16 things we call the 16 glorious truths. You can download the full course at www.gsonline.org or if you're in the master class, www.kingdombooksclub.com. Paul spoke about 16 things that we ought to know. And that is why the school paradigm is so important. Because in the school paradigm, you are not doing high octane preaching to make people excited. You are systematically taking the word to do a work of discipleship in the people. It transforms their hearts. It renews their mind. They grow from grace to grace from where they were. By the time you finish a particular course of study, whether it is three years or two years, these people are rooted in the Lord. They know who they are. They're able to go forth in their identity. So Paul now began to talk about our identity in the Lord, on the merit of what Yeshua purchased for us at the cross. I've said this many times and I'll say it again. The four Gospels tells us the biography of Yeshua HaMashiach, who he is, how he came from heaven to the earth, his works, his word, the miracles, all that. But the Pauline epistles contain truths, the body of truth, or what is it that Yeshua purchased at the cross? In other words, what is the benefit of the cross? And then Paul tells us about 16 of them. I'll just give you a summary, and I want you to go to the, these two websites I mentioned. Go and download 16 glorious truths to study. What are they? Well, number one, grace. Everything is by grace. No one comes into the kingdom on his own. Not because you are righteous or your good deeds. It's by grace. We are saved through faith. And so Ephesians 2, 1 to 8 explains the mechanism. And grace is our life. Everything we do is by grace. If I'm preaching now, it's by grace. By grace, I receive the message for today. By grace, I'm communicating. No room for boasting. Everything is by grace. The strength of God, the power of God, the ability of Elohim, which he gives to us and uses our vessels to do what needs to be done. Number two, election. We well, didn't just happen. Before the foundation of this world, when the Lamb was slain, according to Revelation 13, 8, it was also the time, according to Ephesians 1, 4, that we were chosen in Yeshua before the foundation of this world. It is election that drove everything around us. And so we need to understand that redemption was not a plan B. After Adam and Eve sinned, Elohim began to scratch his head, what do I do? No, they knew that Adam and Eve would miss it. Three, redemption. We are redeemed from the hand of Satan, of sin, and of the world. Yeshua paid the price. He took his blood, shed it. Satan had a legal hold over humanity when he able to, was able to successfully tempt Adam and Eve and when they sinned, they gave their mantle to him. Because who you submit to is your Lord. And so, that lordship of Satan as the God of this world subsisted until that day Yeshua paid the price. And all who come to Yeshua have received the benefit of the blood he shed as a redemption price. So we are now redeemed from the hand of Satan. But many people stop there. It's not just that. It's the power to say no to sin. Not just there, it's the power to recover the identity we have as sons of Elohim right there at the beginning of time when Yeshua, I mean Elohim told us why he created the world, that we will be his sons in the earth ring who are going to take care of the earth on his behalf. Number four is justification and righteousness. Two in one context. Just as you have a coin, one side, one side. Justification says God didn't just forgive your sin, he wiped it clean. It doesn't matter. 20 abortions, it doesn't matter. Murder, it doesn't matter. Everything you had has stained your garment. The day you truly encounter the Lord, he, wipe, he forgives and then blots out. And you can stand before the Lord as one that never sinned before. And the other side of it, righteousness, you now stand before the Lord in on the merit of what Yeshua accomplished at the cross. That's righteousness. You look at Romans 3, 21 to 22 and 2 Corinthians 5, 21 and other scriptures, they are there for you. Number five, we are his new creation on earth. We are not a patchwork. 
The believer is not a patchwork. We are minted fresh and new. Bespoke. That's why there's no business trying to imitate anybody. The principle in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and Ephesians 3, I mean Ephesians 2, 1, 2, 3 is for real. We are new creation of Elohim. And then Paul said again that we have adoption. That's number six, adoption. Adoption is the, is the principle that, you know what? If you adopt a child, that child is yours legally. The day you sign the adoption paper, you cannot mistreat the child. Even if you have a, a child letter, you cannot now treat that person you adopted any less because by legal means, that child is now your child. So also are we adopted into the family of Elohim. As said in Ephesians 1, 5 and Romans 8, 50, we are now adopted. We have fellowship. We have that grace to be part of the family of Elohim. Number seven, we are positioned. Our position changes because we are now born again. Listen to this. Our spirit man, even though we are on earth and people may disregard you, they look at you, you are not beautiful enough, you are not handsome enough, you don't have much education, you don't have much money, you are not living in one of those beautiful zip codes and post codes. It doesn't matter. If you are born again, your spirit man is seated with Yeshua in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and everything that is named in heaven and on earth. Ephesians 2, 1 to 6 tells us about this position. Then, number eight, on the other side of position is that on earth, we are not ordinary. We are mobile temples of Holy Spirit. He has bought us, the Lord has bought us with his blood. And the Holy Spirit indwells us. So anywhere we go, to the mall, to school, to our workplace, anywhere and everywhere, driving, Holy Spirit is with us. We can't switch off at home and then go to church and switch on. No, we are mobile temple anywhere and everywhere. First Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Then number nine, we have security. The new creation has security. You see, according to Colossians 3, 3, our life is hidden with Yeshua in the Father. It will take Satan to defeat the Father, an impossibility. To defeat Yeshua, an impossibility before he can get at you. We are totally secure. So there's no basis of being afraid of any man. And Psalm 91 is our portion. Number 10, we have dual citizenship. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And here on earth, where he plants us, we are citizens. So what do we do? Our primary loyalty is to heaven. And from that loyalty, we, we are able to interact with any other government. So if any government law requires me to be disloyal to Elohim, no, he said, no, brother, no way. We stand our ground, brothers and sisters. But then it doesn't mean we should not behave anyhow in the earth realm. No, there are laws that are, oh, there are laws to govern peace in a nation we are supposed to obey. So, Second Peter, I mean First Peter three, First Peter two, eleven to fifteen talks about this, and Philippians three, twenty to twenty one. Number eleven, we are the showpiece of Elohim. Ephesians chapter two, verse ten, and Romans eight, sixteen to twenty three talks about this. That the Lord didn't just you know didn't just redeem us. Ephesians tells us two ten where his workmanship. The Lord has been fashioning us as the great potter to display us fearfully and wonderfully made. So the excellence of his creation is supposed to rest in us because he has packaged us to represent him. Then number 13, we are to, or number 12 rather, we, are, we have guaranteed outcomes, the redeemed of the Lord. Romans 8.28, all things work together for their good. It doesn't matter where the wind blows, it's going to end up with the purpose of the Father. Number, number uh, 13, we walk and live by faith, not by sight. Second Corinthians 5, 7. Faith is the sixth sense. Only believers have, have it. All believers don't have that sixth sense. Yes, it's true. They can guess, they can try, they can try. But for us, it's a facility for us to be able to live the spiritual life. Elohim is a spirit, he's in heaven. The bridge between the natural and the supernatural, the natural, the 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 the, 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 the
present and the eternal is the bridge of faith. It's by faith that we saw him, that he died for us. It's by faith that we believe. And it's by faith we are supposed to live in all things. Number 14, we have an inheritance in him. All that the Father has is ours. All, not some. All things are ours. We are supposed to know our inheritance. We are supposed to know so that we are not destabilized by people coming to give us sweet tongue, sweet tongue prophecy. We don't need anybody's prophecy to know our inheritance. And once you know your identity and know your assignment, your inheritance will follow you as our locations for your assignment. And how do you know? Whatever the Lord wants to accomplish to you, he's already ordained how he will fund it. And all you need is to trust him, keep your hand on the plow, do what he does, and he will bring it to pass. We are supposed to know whose we are and who we serve. Number 15, we are sealed by Holy Spirit unto the door of redemption. That seal guarantees that if the person continues in the faith, he will fill you with the fullness of Holy Spirit. It also guarantees that if you die before Yeshua returns, before the door of the trumpet, you'll be resurrected. And if you are alive on the day of the trumpet, that's the guarantee that you'll be raptured or changed in a moment. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 to 22, Ephesians 4, 30, and 1 Corinthians 4, 13 to 18. And then number 16, we are the delegated authority of Yeshua in the earth realm. He has commissioned us to represent him. We are not church folks. We are kingdom citizens. We are kingdom ambassadors. He has given us authority, the use of his name, the power of the blood, the power of Holy Spirit in us, according to Acts 1, 8, go forth to go and preach in his, and impact nations and make disciples of all. Believers who are not taught these truths will be walking in re religion. But when they are taught these truths and believe them and make them flesh in them, then they can take their place. That's why the Lord wants the church to run on the school paradigm. The school paradigm doesn't stop on those glorious truths. It also tells us about nine fundamental seas that represents our response to what the Lord is doing. Number one of them, again by Paul the Apostle, is conversion. This time Peter brings up the, the, this word, brother Peter. Acts 3, 19. He said, repent and be converted. A lot of people repent of sin A or sin B or sin D, adultery, fornication, lying, cheating, this, murder, da, da, da. And those things do not represent conversion. So you find most churches are filled with people who have repented of one sin or the other. But conversion speaks about the encounter with the Lord that changes one inside out. Conversion speaks about change of heart and mind regarding sin, the day you truly encounter the Lord that brings about a new creature. And if we teach these things and truly press in on it, I can tell you the church will be radically different. We need people who are truly converted, not church converts, not church folks, but converts who have encountered Yeshua. They repented of their sin and they are converted. They sin that sin is sinful and they reject sin fundamentally and his righteousness takes over their life. So, brothers and sisters, number two is consecration. When the Lord redeems you, you are not supposed to live for yourself anymore. You are not supposed to carry your agenda, then go to church and looking for a man of God to give you prophecy where God will you use God to fulfill your agenda. No, that is idolatry. To turn God into one who is worshipping you. No. The day we are saved, the next thing the Lord expects us out of gratitude is to take our whole life, our ambition, our plan, everything we are, lay it at the altar of sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to him, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Totally consecrate all to him. It is only consecrated vessels that the Lord can use to do what he will do. If you don't consecrate, whatever part of you don't consecrate, that 1%, that 5%, that 10%, that 20% you withhold from the Lord, that's where Satan will use to come back to hold you, to control you. But when you are 100% consecrated to the Lord, then the Lord can begin to use you to do what he wants to do. It doesn't matter your physical feature. It doesn't matter what you have or don't have. Once you are consecrated, then 
you are no longer owning yourself. He owes you. He will determine what he wants to do with you. Number three, character. We are called upon to grow in the character of Yeshua, the life of Yeshua. And that comes by abiding in him and he in us. That comes by as we abide in him. And no matter what happens to us, you know what? The fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit begins to manifest through us. Galatians 2, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And he does the work. Holy Spirit does the work. Both to will and to do in us. Philippians 1, 6 and Philippians 2, 12 to 16. So the character of Christ is who we are when nobody is watching. Who we are when we are on our own. What goes on inside of us? What is our prize at which we are going to give in to Satan? Are we made up that no way to Satan? The character will be tested by fire. Number four, charity. A life of love that is poured out, that is a blessing, a life that consists of loving the law with everything in us and loving people, loving. And First Corinthians 13 tells us about the properties of law. And John 13, 34, 35 tells us is the commandment that Yeshua gave to us. Number five is commitment. Commitment based on Matthew 6, 19 to 34 is a primary commitment to the kingdom where everything, our heart, everything about us is channeled to the kingdom to pursue the kingdom and its righteousness and we are delivered from any other attachment as we pursue the kingdom this way. It just begins to be our life. Number six is communion. Communion has two dimensions. One, regular Pray without season. We're in communion with the Father. We don't just hold words at Him. We hear from Him. We don't just hold words at Him. We hear from Him. And He can speak to us anywhere, anytime. It's not just when we're at the altar of prayer. The altar is good. I have my place where I, I stay. And heavens are open. That's true. But communion ought to be such that anywhere you are, aircraft, anywhere, you can hear from the Lord as you pray. You hear from Him. Communion also is sideways. Fellowship with other brethren who the Lord brings us into harmonious with. Not people who have come to be spots in our feast of charity. Because today you have people who just come to attach themselves to God's people or they hear that fellowship, they have a loving this thing, they come and attach to come and take. No, not pests. But communion has to do with a life where everybody is involved in building up. You are releasing and receiving. And grace is released upon the saints. You know, men and brethren, First Corinthians, First Thessalonians 5, 17 talks about prayer without ceasing. And then Ephesians 4, 1 to 16 talks about how the body should be a communion of saints. Number seven, call. Every saint is called to be a minister, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Every, not a few. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. I should go and bring forth abundantly that will remain. And all the great commission was given to everybody. And in the new covenant, new kingdom church, every believer should be made to know that they have a call. Not everybody will be a pastor. Not everybody will be a prophet, as some people mistakenly do. But everybody will discover their place. Some will be up front, some will be middle, some will be behind. But they will all be satisfied doing what the Lord has called them to do. And when you understand this, you will know what is your call. What is the dimension of your call? What is the place of your call? And you'll be able to be open to the Lord. Number nine, number eight, we are called to cling to him. Cling to him. No matter what happens, John 15, 1 to 8, we cling to him. It doesn't matter what happens. The wind blows. The storm comes. We cling to him. And it is it's in the clinging to him, brothers and sisters, that we depend on Holy Spirit to surrender our will to him and cling to him, and he sees us through. And then number nine is covenant cautiousness. Every saint is in covenant with the Father through the blood of Yeshua. And he says, walk in that consciousness of who you are or what you are. It is to, to be must proceed to do. You see, in the in the worldly church or the religious church they just zap up people with all kinds of things in the kingdom church first level is to teach saints to be 
who the Lord has called them to be. To become experientially, to experientially have what the Lord says they are in the world. And then from there, to do. To be must proceed to do. To be with him must proceed to go for him. And when we understand what Peter said as the royal priesthood, the ten things, when we understand the 16 glorious truths Paul spoke about, and these fundamental seeds that Paul spoke about with Peter, on the one on conversion, the brother or sister is basically primed to begin to step forward to do the work of the Lord. And that is how the church ought to be. Any church where these people are taught these things until they get it and get it and walk in it, that is a living church. A living church is not one with a super anointed preacher who can make fire come down from heaven. You can do all that yet you are not connected to heaven. In fact, some of the people who are not in the heaven at all, who Satan has sent, who have infiltrated the church, they are going to do much more miracles than the person who are believers. But a living church is one where the body is fully activated. Everybody doing their own part. The, belief, the leader is not spoon-feeding any. He's not trying to make anybody happy. He's not trying to use public relations to keep people. Everybody knows, as unto the Lord, what you are. You bring it forth, I bring it forth, we bring it forth. The whole body is functional. Brothers and sisters, by way of assignment today, please briefly discuss each of the ten truths in 1 Peter 2, 9 to 12. Two, brief, please briefly discuss what you understand from each of the 16 glorious truths. Just brief, it doesn't matter, just two lines. What do you understand? Three, briefly discuss each of the nine fundamental seas. And you can download both the glorious truths and the fundamental seas at those two sites, www.gsomonline.org or www.kingdombooksclub.com. If you want the videos, go to True Kingdom Life channel on YouTube. That's a portal. About a thousand three hundred and something videos are there. These are created. And even if the Lord comes and takes the church up, those who did not make it will have resources with which to continue in the faith and make the choice not to go and commit suicide because they miss the rapture, but to know that there's chance for them, there's hope for them. So we're not doing any of these projects only for now, as the Lord has showed us. The Omega Church is rising, but it's not all of us who are here. There are those who join after the rapture, when it will become clear to them that they have been in error all along. And so they need resources also. So brothers and sisters, let's all cooperate. Share this video. Share it extensively. Share it within your circle. And let's continue to receive we are going to discuss some very critical things about the Kingdom Church this evening by 7 p.m. London time, 2 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Central time, and 8 p.m. South African time. Please wait for it. And before then, by 5.30 p.m. London time, which is 12.30 p.m. Eastern time, and 11.30 p.m. Central time, we are going to have a TBN Africa broadcast on TBN Africa. We are about to round up our broadcast on TBN. At the end of this month, it will end because we don't have the capacity to sustain it. Or we just thank the Lord. We're just happy. Nothing, no regret, nothing. The Lord has used somebody to get us to a point and now we have done much. And the, but I have good news for you. TBN Africa has decided to give us a channel for six months just to make sure that this is not lost. So they decided to give us what they call TBA Year 2, another channel to broadcast from July to, to be there for six months. But all we need to do is to now raise production fee with our producers who are in South Africa to produce that. And if you know this miracle, if you know the miracle of all the airing fee from July off, all we need is to be able to fund the production if you know the miracle, you know that the Lord is gracious. But listen, if the Lord doesn't provide for it, we won't feel bad. That's the way of the kingdom. 
But if he provides for it to any minister, any brother, any sister, praise the Lord. We go ahead. And so we love you all and we pray, pray that the Lord will bless you in any way he wants. That above all, you understand these truths and these truths shall set you free and you will function the way the Lord has ordained. Thank you so much, elect, for being with us. And elect is back from school and is going to come on to help us as special assistants.